and works at Kids Escaping Drugs, particularly the face-to-face -face program. Uh, I've had a, a, a really strong and professional and personal relationship working with Kids Escaping Drugs and helping students uh, and parents you know, be educated on all these important, uh, all the important details that everybody really needs to know about, but it's really sometimes uh, amazing what you learn uh, here in these presentations. I think I've seen Jessica present 16, 20, 25, 30 times over the past eight years, and I honestly can say every time I've learned something new. And it's really an eye-opener, and it's so important for us to be as educated as possible about the dangers that exist, the gateways uh, to some really poor uh, decisions that young people make, and I'm just grateful that we're all here today to learn some more. So I'm going to turn over for Jessica. In fact, let's give her a big welcome. Okay. Good evening to all of you. First of all, thank you for being here. I'm sure there's a hundred other places you could be and a hundred other things you could be doing with your time. Um, second of all, thank you for the warm welcome. I'm happy to be here. Um, as Dr. Graham mentioned, um, I'm here to tell you a little bit about who Kids, kids Escaping Drugs is, what services we offer to the community, and why those services are so incredibly important. Um, so the presentation tonight is going to consist of a very fact-filled PowerPoint that I promise won't bore you. If it does, I'm doing something wrong. Um, and then you'll have the opportunity to hear from um, a parent who is going to put a personal perspective on all of these facts that I've just thrown at you. If you guys have questions while I'm presenting, please feel free to just raise your hand and ask. It's a small group, so we can keep it um, pretty casual. Can everybody hear me? Okay. So just a little bit of background about what Kids Escaping Drugs is. Um, Kids Escaping Drugs is a foundation that was established over 25 years ago because at that time there was no place anywhere in western New York for an adolescent to go for residential treatment if they became addicted to drugs and alcohol. There was nowhere they could go for long-term treatment. There was nowhere that their families could reach out for support. And 25 years ago in western New York, teenagers were drinking alcohol, they were smoking marijuana. Every once in a while, a young person might become addicted to a drug like cocaine. But society in general didn't, didn't take addiction and look at it and how it could impact a teenager the way we do that today. Addiction was seen as something that adults could struggle with, but nobody thought that a teenager could ever be a drug addict or an alcoholic. Um, well, the drug problem, unfortunately, has gotten worse. And today, teenagers are becoming addicted to prescription drugs. They are sticking needles into veins in all different parts of their bodies to shoot up with drugs like heroin. And they are losing their lives to overdoses at very, very young ages. Um, accidental overdose is happening on a weekly basis in Western New York. And sometimes when it's bad, which right now um, our numbers are pretty bad, we're seeing it happen on a daily basis. Um, I started working for Kids Escaping Drugs in 2009. In that year, I attended one funeral for one boy who lost his life to an overdose, and that was difficult. Um, in 2015, we went to 34 funerals for kids who lost their life to overdose. And some of those kids were young people that we had treated on our campus who had relapsed. Um, others were friends of young people that we had gotten to know through the kids we treated on our campus, and others were just people we knew in the community. But there were countless others who lost their lives to overdose in 2015 as well. Um, those were just the handful, truly, that, that we knew of. Um, so I think that number in and of itself demonstrates how tremendous this drug problem has gotten over the last few years. And again, that's why I'm so grateful that you're all here tonight doing something to learn about it. Um, so the long story short is that 25 years ago, when the drug problem was not nearly as terrible as it is today, we still developed this need in Western New York for this treatment facility. So Kids Escaping Drugs raised several million dollars. Um, that money was raised through primarily the generosity of people who live right here in Western New York. And that money was used to build a place called the Renaissance Campus. Um, the Renaissance Campus has been around for a while, about 25 or so years. Um, if you're not familiar with it, it's located in West Seneca. We are right near the corner of Clinton and Harlem and Chippewa kind of all meet together. Operated as a 62-bed residential rehab facility. And that means that the kids that come to our campus make the commitment to live there for as long as it takes for them to get clean and sober. And historically, that length of stay has been anywhere from five to six months. 
So it's very long-term, intensive residential treatment. Well, in the last month, Kids Escaping Drugs received a grant from New York State Oasis, which is our governing and our licensing body in New York State, um, to add on to the services that we offer to kids in Western New York. So in the spring, we will be breaking ground for a new facility. Um, in that new building, we'll offer both stabilization services and reintegration services. Now, in layman's terms, stabilization services is basically like a detox for kids. It'll be a place where kids can go and kind of medically get the supervision that they need before they enter into um, an intensive rehab program. And then on the back end of that re intensive rehab program, we'll have this reintegration level of service, which is essentially like a halfway house. Um, if you're not familiar with a halfway house, it's basically like a step down from residential treatment. The kids will live in that building, but they will leave the campus every day to go to school. They'll be able to go and work part-time jobs and kind of reintegrate back into the community, but they'll still have the safety of that building and that program to return to every night with 24-hour, seven-day-a-week staff. Um, currently, the Renaissance Campus is the only intensive rehabilitation program available to an adolescent in Western New York under the age of 18. Currently, we have zero stabilization services for you, and we have zero reintegration services for you. They don't exist for someone under the age of 18. So if a young person is currently withdrawing from a drug like an opiate, like a painkiller, they will not get a bed in a hospital to go through detox. Um, so we're really, really happy to be bringing these services to the Western New York community. They are tremendously, tremendously needed. So. For the last 25 years, Kids Escaping Drugs as an organization has continued to raise money to support the treatment facilities that we have, and we're expanding on those. Um, but we've also expanded our mission statement a great deal in the last decade to include community outreach. And our community outreach program is known as Face to Face. Um, Face to Face is the program that I'm proud to run for Kids Escaping Drugs. And it's all about coming out into the community and educating anybody who will listen to us talk, quite honestly. Um, about the dangers and the consequences of adolescent addiction, as well as the signs, the symptoms, and the trends, which are ever-changing. Um, working in this field every day, I can tell you, I learn something new every single day from these kids that I didn't know the day before. So we do community outreach in, a, in several different ways. Um, the first thing that we have is a peer-to-peer -peer program. That program involves bringing young people who are in recovery, they are primarily kids who have graduated from our treatment program, into the community, um, mainly through middle schools and high schools all over Western New York. Um, and those kids share their stories with their peers. And when they share their stories of their addiction, they focus very heavily on the dangers and the consequences that addiction brought into their life. And what we hear from kids in the communities after they share this message is that hearing that from somebody their own age has such a greater impact for them than any type of authoritative figure giving them a just say no talk. They need to just say no talks, and we support those 100%. But they also need to be aware of what the potential consequences are if they don't stand up to that situation and say no. So that's what we're trying to do through our peer-to-peer -peer program. Um, we launched that program in 2008. Um, when we launched that program, we were partnered with six school districts in Erie County. We are now partnered with well over 150 in all eight counties of Western New York. Um, so that program has grown tremendously. Um, historically, we have done a lot to educate adults um, through functions like you're attending tonight. Things that are hosted by various school districts in Western New York um, that typically take place on a weekday in the evening. And they're great, and sometimes we get great attendance, but what we find is that um, a lot of parents who really need to get this information can't always attend a function that takes place on a weekday in the evening because they might have to work in the evening. They might have to arrange childcare. They might have one kid playing basketball, the other playing soccer, and you guys know when you have a list this long of things to do when you get home from work in the evening, the drug talk is unfortunately the first thing to go when you just simply don't have enough time. And in the light of the heroin epidemic that we're dealing with in Western New York, we really wanted to come up with a way to make it more convenient for adults to be educated. So we're still doing the school thing. We will always do the, you know, the community-based programs. Um, but we've also launched a program called Face to Face in the Workplace. And we are going into various companies and organizations all over Western New York, and we're meeting people where they're at, which is at work. Um, and we're giving employers the opportunity to educate their employees about the signs and the symptoms and the trends of adolescent addiction, 
um, in a way that's convenient and stigma-proof for them. And I'm proud to say that Dr. Graham has us coming in to educate all of the education professionals in the district um, just before I go out to have my baby. <laughs> so they'll be hearing from me. Um, so if any of you work at companies or organizations and you the presentation that I give in Face to the Face in the Workplace is nearly identical to what I'm giving to you tonight. So if you find it beneficial and you, and you work for companies that you think would support us coming in and doing that, we will come anywhere in Western New York and we won't charge you a penny to do it. Um, so keep that in mind. Um, another thing we offer through Face to Face is our Early Intervention Program. And our Early Intervention Program is what I like to, to coin as the reactive piece to the proactive program. So it's intended for kids who are um, identified as being at risk of developing a drug problem. These are kids who are experimenting with something and they get caught by mom or dad. Um, these are kids who might bring something to school that they definitely shouldn't have at school. They have the opportunity to come out to Kids Escaping Drugs, which is located right on the Renaissance campus in West Seneca. They meet with a drug and alcohol counselor, as well as with young people who are in recovery. We require that a parent attend the session with the child. It's a one-time meeting. It only lasts about an hour to an hour and a half. And the goal of that program is to assess where that child's at in their experimentation and link them up with the appropriate level of intervention or support in their home community so that that experimentation doesn't have the opportunity to progress into a full-blown addiction. Um, they meet with a counselor. They meet with the kids in recovery. The parent and the child do that separate from each other. So the parent picks the brain of, of the young people that we have on campus. Um, they, they have the opportunity to express their concerns with the counselor. Um, and then we link that family up with support. Um, we offer this program at no cost to any family anywhere in Western New York. And we can typically get a family in for this within 72 hours of when they contact us for an appointment. So if at any point in time any of you have young people and you just get that gut feeling that something isn't right, Call us and take advantage of this program before it becomes more of a problem than you think it already is. Um, we will work with kids in this program at any point in their substance use, but we see the greatest success with it when they're in those early stages of, of experimentation with substances. So that is also a program that's available to anyone who may need it. So when we go into the schools, we always ask the kids, what's the, what's the first thing that comes to your mind when you hear the word drug addict or you hear the term alcohol? And from their perspective, it's always a man with dirty hair and yellow teeth and ripped and tattered clothes, and usually he lives under a bridge with a paper bag in his hand. Um, from their perspective, it's, it's rarely ever a woman. It's not somebody who gets up and goes to work every day. And it's definitely not a teenager. And if you go on Google and you type in the word drug addict or alcoholic, this is one of the many images that will come up on your, on your Google image search for you. And this stereotype of addiction is preventing a lot of teenagers from ever believing that they can have a drug problem or an alcohol problem because they look nothing like this image. And more so than that, it prevents a lot of parents from recognizing that their child could be struggling with addiction. Because if we're all honest with ourselves, this is what society has allowed us to believe about addiction and, and alcoholism. The reality of addiction and alcoholism in Western New York, from our perspective, looks a lot more like this. Um, we are treating, on our campus, your average American teenager. We have kids on our campus from the suburbs. We have kids on our campus from the cities. We have kids on our campus from the most rural areas of Western New York. Um, we have kids whose parents are married, kids whose parents are separated, kids whose parents are divorced. We have kids whose parents are doctors, lawyers, politicians, state troopers, um, kids from all walks of life. And so, so much of what we're trying to do in the community when we talk to adults like all of you and also when we give our presentations to kids is not only educate about the dangers and the consequences and the signs and the symptoms and the trends, but we're also trying to break through this stereotype and help families recognize that addiction doesn't discriminate. And if somebody that you care about is using substances, that's not something to be ashamed of, that's something to do something about um, and get some support around. Um, so we're really trying to break through that stereotype and reduce the stigma that comes with your disease of addiction. So now for the interesting part. Um, I want to spend the majority of the time I have with you this evening trying to paint you a picture of the drug problem in Western New York from the perspective of kids. And I'm going to go through a lot of different substances that kids are using. I'm going to explain what they look like, how they're used, and how one substance correlates with the next. 
and how unfortunately we found ourselves in the midst of this awful heroin epidemic that we're dealing with. And with teenagers, that all still starts with alcohol and marijuana. No news, I'm sure, to any of you. Um, young people have been drinking alcohol and smoking marijuana for a very long time. Those substances are very, very socially accepted among teenagers. They're becoming even more socially accepted. The problem is they are nothing like the way they were 20 or 30 years ago. So let's start with alcohol. Think about a light beer for a second. A can of Bud Light, a bottle of Blue Light, 12 ounce serving, whether you get it in a can or a bottle. Um, typically that 12 ounce serving will contain anywhere from three and a half to 4% alcohol volume per 12 ounces. Now we have products on the market like Bud Light Platinum and Blue Light Royal, which are marketed as light beers. They taste just like light beers. They come in the same 12 ounce can or bottle, but the alcohol concentration is far from light. Um, those products contain up to 8% alcohol volume per 12 ounces. IPA beers have become very popular in Western New York. Every brewery makes an IPA. Um, your typical 12 ounce serving of an IPA beer contains anywhere from 8 to 12% alcohol volume. Um, forget the beer for a second. How many of you have heard of a product called uh, Johnny Bootlegger? Show of hands. That's usually the response. <laughs> so Johnny Bootlegger comes in a small glass bottle. Um, it's shaped just like a flask. Um, teenagers love it because it fits in their pocket really nicely. It's a lot easier to hide than a bottle of rum or a bottle of vodka. Johnny Bootlegger is um, fruity in flavor. It's kind of got like a thick and syrupy texture. It's sold at the liquor store. It's commonly found behind the counter or at the counter. Um, it's intended to be mixed with a soda or a juice or a seltzer of some kind. You know, a little bit of Johnny Bootlegger and the rest is soda. Um, kids don't drink it that way. They unscrew that little cap, they swing it back just like you'd swing back a flask, and they chug the whole bottle. I've tasted this stuff. It's not difficult to drink on its own. Um, depending on what size and what flavor Johnny Bootlegger you buy, that product contains anywhere from 12 to 16% alcohol volume. There's another product on the market known as Four Loco. How many of you have heard of that one? Okay, that one's a little more popular. Um, Four Loco, when it first became available on the market, was a combination of alcohol and caffeine. And they had to remove the product from the market because people were having a lot of heart problems. Um, the caffeine in the product was telling people's hearts to speed up, and the alcohol was telling people's hearts to slow down. And when your heart doesn't know what to do, it just quits. And that's what was happening. So they took it off the market and they removed the caffeine. And they put it right back on the market with the same amount of alcohol in it that it had before. It comes in a 23.5 ounce can, so it's shaped just like an Arizona iced tea can, real tall and slender. Um, comes in all different flavors. Again, it's very fruity, it's carbonated, it's very, very easy to drink. Um, and one of these cans of Four Loco, again, depending on what flavor you buy, can contain anywhere from 8 to 12% alcohol volume. Now, you or I might walk into a gas station or a convenience mart where Four Loco is commonly purchased, and we might see that 12% alcohol volume stamped on that can, and we might think to ourselves, whoa, one can is more than enough for an evening out with friends. Teenagers don't do that either. Um, in their mind, one can equals one drink. They crack it open, they pound it down, and they're ready for the next can. And so I have the opportunity to work with teens often after they've had these experiences with these highly concentrated alcohol products. And when you talk to them, they've experienced things like having their stomach pumped at the hospital because they're so overly intoxicated. They've gotten DWIs at the age of 16 or 17 years old. And when you have conversations with them after the fact, they sit there and they tell you, this is something I picked up at Tops or Wegmans. I didn't think twice about how much alcohol I was consuming. They're just very highly concentrated products that quite honestly are marketed to a younger crowd. Um, they're colorful, they're fruity, they're fun. We're seeing something very similar happen with marijuana. Marijuana in and of itself is nothing like the marijuana of the 60s or the 70s. Um, first of all, the THC content in marijuana, which is the part of the marijuana that gets you high, um, is double what it was 20 or 30 years ago. What's more concerning than that is that the DEA reports to us that 90% of the marijuana that's used in Western New York for recreational purposes has something else in it. And by something else, it's either some type of filler that a drug dealer is putting in it to spread their supply out further and make more money off of it, or more common recently, that something else is another drug. And drug dealers are lacing marijuana with other drugs, 
so that people get hooked on a product that provides a more intense or a better high, they keep coming back to that dealer for that better product, and that guarantees the drug dealer an income. That's 90% of what's being confiscated in Western New York. Now, when we think about teenagers and marijuana, their perception of risk with marijuana is decreasing. And that's across the country. And in my opinion, that has a lot to do with the messaging they're getting around medicinal marijuana. You know, mm -hmm. doctors are prescribing marijuana for things like glaucoma and seizures, and it's working for those things. Um, but what nobody's explaining, especially to our teenagers, or to really anybody in the general public, is that the marijuana that's used for medical purposes has had most of the THC removed from it. So you're not going to get high from it the way you get high from something that you're using for recreational purposes. Um, so kids are under this impression that marijuana must be safe because it's prescribed by doctors. And that's the same problem we ran into with prescription drugs 12 or 15 years ago, if you think back. You know, teenagers thought they were prescribed by doctors, so they must be safe. They knew when they took a pill, there was no chance of that pill being cut or laced with something else. They knew if they bought a Loratab, they were taking a Loratab. And we have an entire generation of young people who are completely physically dependent on prescription drugs. And what they don't realize about the abuse of prescription drugs when they first start to use them is that they cannot be used recreationally. There are many teenagers who drink a little bit of alcohol on Friday or Saturday night, or maybe they smoke a little bit of marijuana, and you know what? They get up on Monday morning, they come to school, they do what they've got to do, they never get in trouble with the law, and their substance use is a phase that they throw up. There are many kids who use socially who never develop an addiction when they use alcohol or marijuana. If they try to do that with prescription drugs, that will not happen. They cannot be used socially. Um, you become addicted to a prescription painkiller sometimes within the third or fourth time that you experiment with them. So what will happen is they'll use a couple of pills on the weekend and then all of a sudden they get up on Monday morning to come to school and withdrawal hits them in the face like a ton of bricks. And if nobody has ever explained an opiate withdrawal to you, it is described as the worst flu you could ever remember having in your life multiplied by a thousand. You have hot and cold sweats. You're throwing up. You have diarrhea. You feel like you have bugs crawling under your skin. And no matter what you do, you're not going to get rid of that crawly feeling. Um, you're freezing cold, and you want to stand under the hot shower to warm yourself up. But when the water touches your skin, it will be unbearably painful. And so when people experience an opiate withdrawal, they are debilitated. They don't shower for a week at a time. They can't get out of bed for a week at a time. And they certainly aren't going to school or work for a week at a time. And the only way to make yourself feel better and to make these symptoms more tolerable when you're experiencing this withdrawal is to take more opiates. And the reason why that is is because opiates um, cause us to have these additional pockets in our brains where the opiates fall into. And when you take an artificial opiate, meaning something that your body's not producing naturally, you create lots of these extra cups. And unless you keep putting more and more opiate into your system, your body is going to tell you that's not enough opiate, give me more. And its way of telling you that is to put you in pain so that you give it more pain relief. That's, that's how the chemical part of the addiction works. Um, yes? Um, I just have a question. In terms of what you described as being addicted within two to three times, if you say you use pain killers, are you talking about teenagers that are using more than... More than is prescribed. Is. I should have said when they misuse them. Yes. I'm talking okay. about... Well, the you're talking is like lack of and that can So I'm talking about kids who are taking like three or four pills when the bottle tells you to take one. Okay. So they're misusing. They're using more than what the doctor okay. is prescribing. So they go through this awful withdrawal. Um, and, you know, they get to a point where they, they can't keep it up with these pills. They need more and more of these pills, and they can't afford them. They're very expensive on the street. And I'm going to break that down for you on a later slide and explain what the cost is. Um, but from there, we see them make the progression into heroin. Okay? If you're not aware, a prescription painkiller, whether it's a Lortab, a Hydrocodone, an Oxycontin, an Opana, a Vicodin, you name the brand name, they are all synthetic forms of heroin. Okay? A pill is made in a lab by a chemist, and heroin comes from an opiate plant. But when you look at the two substances under a microscope, they are identical to one another in chemical structure. So they have the same effect on our body. Um, heroin is still that awful stigmatized drug that every teenager in western New York promises themselves that they're never going to use. But it's way cheaper than pills are, and I'm going to talk about that. 
And so unfortunately, we see kids make this progression. Now, just to give you an idea of this, 90% of the patients that we treat on our rehab campus come into rehab with an addiction to a prescription painkiller. 70% of our patients come in with an IV heroin addiction. They are shooting up multiple times a day to support their habit. Again, I remind you, these are your average American kids who have gotten caught up in a bad thing and can't find their way out of it on their own. That's a very scary number. Um, I also want to spend a couple of minutes tonight talking to you about some substances that you may not be familiar with. You've all heard of alcohol and marijuana. You've heard of pills. And unless your head has been buried in the sand somewhere for the last year and a half, you know what heroin is. It's been all over the news. You can't turn on 247 and not see a story about it. How many of you have heard of dabs or wax or dabbing? Show of hands. You don't count, right? <laughs> How many of you have heard of a drug called Molly? OK, people know about that one. How about something called lean or purple drink or scissor? They're all the same thing. OK, I'll knock your socks off with those two. So I'm going to break this down for you guys a little bit further. You've heard me talk a lot about prescription painkillers. And by far and large, prescription painkillers are the most common type of prescription drug to be abused by a young person. But you can't forget about antidepressant drugs, anti-anxiety pills, ADD and ADHD medications are all commonly abused. Any type of controlled substance they're going to use because they're going to get high from it. Um, particularly popular right now is a drug called Xanax, which is a benzodiazepine. What's very scary about benzodiazepines is when you withdraw from those, um, they can send your body into a state of grand mal seizures that you will not wake up from. Those seizures will kill you. The other problem with these pills is kids are mixing them with alcohol. So that's further compounding the negative effects of all of these pills. So regardless of what type of prescription medication they're using, the most common way for them to use it is to crush it up into a powder form and snort the powder. Now, if they take a pill and place it on their tongue and swallow it with a glass of water the way a doctor instructs you to, um, they need to do that with several pills and eventually they'll get high. But it's going to take a while for that pill to break down and make its way through their system. If they crush the pill into the powder form and snort the powder, they're going to be high within a few minutes. However, it causes a very bitter tasting post-nasal drip. Think about if you've ever taken a pill and chewed it when it was supposed to be swallowed. You'll never make that mistake again because that bitter taste you get in your mouth. That's what the post-nasal drip tastes like when they snort these pills. Not a pleasant thing to go through, but you get high so much more quickly than if you were to swallow them that they're willing to do that. So they constantly have a sniffly and a runny nose. Their appetite is suppressed, um, but they're willing to do it because they get high pretty quick. They can also um, smoke these pills in a powder form if they want. They can cook them down and they can inject them. All of that requires a lot more prep work. And when they're ready to get high, they're ready to get high. So they're not going to spend a lot of time prepping the pill for other forms of use. Um, the major difference with prescription drugs as compared to alcohol and marijuana is how normally people will function when they're high on them. If a child comes home drunk on a Friday or Saturday night, you know, you can smell the alcohol on their breath, their eyes are glassy and red, they're slurring their speech, they might be stumbling a bit, and they are beelining into the bedroom more quickly than any other time because they don't want to have a conversation with mom or dad. When they come home high on the weekend, you know that too. They, um, their eyes are glassy and red, you can smell the marijuana on them. If you can't smell the marijuana, you can smell the cologne or the perfume that they've sprayed all over themselves to mask the smell of the marijuana. And instead of beelining it to the bedroom, they're heading to the refrigerator because they have the munchies. These are your classic tall tale signs of alcohol and marijuana abuse. With prescription drug abuse, there's none of that whatsoever. Um, many kids will report that they will blow a couple pills when they get up in the morning. Those pills allow them to function through the morning until about lunchtime. At lunchtime, they blow a couple more pills. They get through the second half of their day. Um, many of them will report that after school, they blow a couple more pills and they can go perform on a sports field exactly as they should. They can be completely engaged in a clever activity. Nobody will know the difference. They can go and work a part-time job and fulfill the responsibilities of those tasks without looking any different. Um, when you begin to notice the abuse of prescription medication is when they have gone many hours without these pills in their system. And the longer they go, the more apparent it is um, because withdrawal starts to set in. But the early stages of withdrawal are a much more mild version than what I explained to you. And they look just like the flu. You know, their, their belly hurts, their joints might be a little sore and achy, they might develop a hot or a cold sweat, 
Um, and they might start to nod off and get lethargic a little bit. And so usually we see this happen around 9 or 10 o'clock at night when kids are home for the night and they're laying on the couch or finishing up their homework and they say to their parents, gee, I'm not, I'm not feeling good. You know, I'm going to go up to bed a little early tonight, catch a little bit of extra sleep, and I'll feel better in the morning. Mom and dad don't think twice about it. They go off to their bedroom and close their door. They blow a couple more pills, which allows them to sleep through the night, and the vicious cycle starts all over again the next day. And so we see the use of these prescription drugs very oftentimes go on for months and months and months before the parents start to pick up on the very subtle warning signs that come with them because they're not those classic tall tail red flags that everybody's so accustomed to. Um, as I mentioned, these prescription pills are not nearly as easy to get as they once were. We have a law in New York State now known as I Stop. Um, basically what I Stop means is that it prevents people from doing something that we call doctor shopping. It prevents somebody from going to multiple doctors, getting multiple prescriptions for the same ache or pain, and then selling those pills on the street for a profit. And prior to this law being passed, that's exactly what people were doing, and they were making thousands of dollars on their prescriptions. Well, you can't do that anymore. Basically, iStop is um, a live time central database that requires um, doctors and pharmacists to log in and record that they are prescribing and dispensing these pills. So you can't do that. So the cost of these prescription pills has gone way up on the street because the supply has gone down significantly. And it has become an incredibly difficult habit for especially a teenager to support. So when kids start out using painkillers, they're typically going to start out with a hydrocodone or a lower tail, which is that center picture you see at the top of the screen. Um, hydrocodone lower tap is prescribed for every ache and pain that you could possibly think of. If you've had a tooth pulled, if you've sprained an ankle, if you suffer from migraine headaches, there's a good chance you've been prescribed either hydrocodone or Loratab. They're the same thing. Um, hydrocodone Loratab is the number one prescribed controlled substance in the United States. And in this country, we consume 95% of the world's supply of hydrocodone Loratab. We make up 7% of the world's population. So this one is still readily available on the street because it's prescribed for so much. So if kids save up their lunch money for a week or two, they've got enough money to get a couple of those pills to get high on the weekend. And when they begin using hydrocodone Loratab, that's all they need is a couple. They typically report maybe two or three to get high. Jessica? Yes? How would a 12, 13, 14 year old find Oh, Loratab? it's not hard for them to find. What? First of all, they know which of their friends have sprained ankles, have had two teeth pulled. They know which of their friends' parents have had surgery in our home for a couple of days from work. Um, and honestly, they know to go home and look in the medicine cabinet and see what's in there. And as soon as they see that controlled substance sticker on that bottle, they know that they can bring those pills somewhere and they can get, make a pretty penny for them. So when they begin using, they need two or three of those hydrocodones or lower tabs. The problem is in a matter of weeks, and I'm talking about maybe three or four, our kids report that they went from sorting two or three of those pills to snorting anywhere from 10 to 15 multiple times a day to feel the same thing they felt from two or three just a couple weeks before. The reason why that is is because hydrocodone Loratab is a low-grade painkiller. So it has this much Tylenol in it, and it only has this much of the desired opiate in it. And so you need more and more of those pills to meet all those extra receptors that you're creating in your brain. And so we see people get to the point where the amount of Tylenol that they're ingesting starts to have a negative impact on their liver, or more common recently, um, they get to the point where they can't snort that much powder back. Again, if you've ever been prescribed these pills, you know what size those white ovals are. Think about it, if you have 10 or 12 of those crushed up in front of your face, that's not a line of powder you have to snort, that's a whole mountain of powder you have to snort back. And that's when we see them make the progression into higher grade pain like Oxycontins, and more recently, these Opanas. Oxycontin and Opana are high-grade painkillers. Um, so they have this much opiate in them, and only this much Tylenol. That 80 milligram Oxycontin pill has been enlarged to show you what it looks like. It's the size of this tiny little plug in the back end of a pen. Teeny, teeny, tiny little pill. that they're snorting four or five of those high-grade painkillers a day. The problem with the high-grade painkillers is they cost anywhere from $80 to $100 per pill, depending on where you are in Western New York and what you're looking for. 
And so this becomes a several hundred dollar a day habit. And it becomes a habit that teenagers especially cannot afford to support. Um, and we see kids start to do some pretty crummy things. They start to do things like pawn their parents' wedding rings and not think twice about it. Um, go to visit their grandparents and steal grandma and grandpa's medications while they're there. Break into cars and houses. Um, stand outside of a Rite Aid or a Walgreens and wait for the elderly to come out the door and rip their prescriptions out of their hand as they do so. And these are not things that our kids are proud of doing. These are things that they do because they are so desperate to avoid that withdrawal because it's so unbearable. And again, they can't keep that up for long. So that's when we see them make the progression into heroin. Um, heroin is so insanely cheap right now in Western New York. A hit of heroin is going for anywhere from five to $10 a hit. Now a hit of heroin is gonna provide you the same high that one of those 80 or $100 pills is. So when you compare five or $10 a hit to 80 or $100 per pill, I don't care how stigmatized that drug is. The stigma goes out the window. Um, heroin's also available in a powder form. So it can be snorted the very same way they're already accustomed to snorting those pills. And that's how they start with it. And they all promise themselves that they will never inject heroin because only when they stick a needle in their arm do they have a drug problem. I can't tell you how many times I've heard that. And they have 101 reasons why they're never going to stick a needle in their arm. Because they're afraid of needles, they don't know how to tie off, they don't know how to hit a vein. They say that only scummy, dirty guys that look like the guy in the picture use needles. In a powder form that day, how convenient. Or they convince them that injection is, first of all, cheaper, because you don't need nearly as much. The high is instant. The second the needle hits the vein, they're high. And it is incredibly, incredibly euphoric. And kids him and haw about this decision for all of a couple of minutes before they stick out their arm, they turn their head the other way, and usually their dealer or a friend of theirs will inject them for the first time because they've never done it before. They're scared to do it. They don't know how to tie off. It's not, I mean, it's a very scary thing to do. Um, but from there, forget it. It doesn't matter if they're afraid of needles. It doesn't matter if heroin's that icky drug they swore they'd never do. Um, it doesn't matter if they don't know how to tie off their arm. They figure that out all very, very quickly, and they are off to the races. Um, and it becomes a very, very slippery slope that they will not find their way out of without some type of support or intervention. So that's how we see the progression happen. Um, we look at some of these numbers that we have locally here for Erie County. Um, you guys are Erie County, right? Or are you not? You are. Okay, good. Um, in 2015, we lost 256 people to opiate-related deaths in Erie County. Now, this is just people who were found with opiates in their system at the time of their death. It does not include people who are involved in a drug deal that went bad and got violent. It doesn't include people who took their lives to suicide because addiction robs them of everything they care about. It's only people who are found with high levels of opiates in their system at the time of their death. 2016 got worse. 2016, there are 247 confirmed deaths so far. However, there are 77 more that are still in testing because the medical examiner's office is so far behind on the autopsies in Erie County because so many people are dying of overdose. So they anticipate by the time they finish counting 2015 that that number will be 324. What's scarier than that is that so far in 2017, there have actually been 53 deaths. I just got an updated number today with an additional three. Um, we're only halfway through February, and we've already, we're already at 53 deaths. So this problem is not getting better. It's getting worse. Um, and, you know, it was covered in the news heavily, I think, in the first half of, second half of 2015, first half of 2016, and you saw it on the news every other day, and then it went away for a little bit. We didn't hear news stories about it. And a lot of people presumed that the drug problem was getting better. And actually, um, Gail Bernstein from the county came out and said that they anticipated that the numbers for 2016 were going to be lower than they initially thought. Well, then we got a really bad batch of heroin in the last couple of weeks of 2016 that killed an obnoxious number of people, um, which caused those numbers to go way back up. Um, so just because you're not hearing about it on the news doesn't mean the problem's getting better. It means that people are sick of hearing about it on the news, and so the news stations stop covering it. Um, so we think about heroin. And we know that it has been around forever. It's been around as long as I've been alive. And we've never seen overdose death rates anywhere near what they are right now. 
The other thing that's not factored into this is Narcan. Do you all know what Narcan is? Okay. Um, so in the city of Buffalo alone, there were, there were somewhere between 1,300 and 1,500 Narcan reversals in 2015. Those are people who were saved with Narcan. So if we didn't have Narcan, our overdose death rate numbers would be in the thousands. They wouldn't be in the hundreds. What was that number again? It's somewhere between 13 and 1,500. They can't track it um, because so many people don't report when they administer Narcan, but that was their best guess for 2015. That was just for the city of Buffalo, though, not for the whole county. Um, so th the problem is out of control. So anyway, heroin's been around forever, and we might wonder why are these overdose death rates as, as bad as they are. It's because of what's being added to heroin, okay? Um, and that's fentanyl. But you can't think about fentanyl in terms of medical-grade fentanyl. You can't think about fentanyl in terms of what's given to somebody who's had major surgery in a hospital or somebody who's in their final days of life in hospice care. Medical grade fentanyl is not intended to be used outside of a very controlled medical environment. So in order for a drug dealer to get their hands on it so that they can add it to their heroin and make their heroin more potent, they would have to spend thousands of dollars on it. Drug dealers are not spending thousands of dollars on medical grade heroin just so that they're on medical grade fentanyl just so that their heroin can be a little more powerful. It doesn't, there's no money to be made there. So the fentanyl that they're adding to the heroin is made in China, and it's made synthetically. It's a combination of several different chemicals, and when those chemicals are combined together, they mimic the effects of medical grade fentanyl. Those chemicals are super cheap, they're legal in the United States, and you can literally have them shipped from China to your front door in massive quantities. Through the, through the United States Postal Service. Um, and that's what heroin dealers are doing. They are having this stuff shipped. Three or four grains of this fentanyl will kill you, no questions asked. However, if you get a hit of heroin that has two grains of this fentanyl in it, you will experience the most intense opiate high you've ever had before in your life. And what you have to remember about people who are opiate addicted is that they are always chasing that high because they very quickly get to that point where they're using just to avoid getting sick. The high that they're longing for went out the window a long time ago. So they're constantly looking for a product that's going to give them that feeling that they so much miss. And they'll find it with the fentanyl. There's a really good chance they won't wake up after they experience that high, but they'll find it. Now, you would think with the media attention that this combination is getting, that opiate addicted people would be fearful of getting this combination. It is being sought out on the streets of Western New York. People want this fentanyl. Yes? Jessica, getting back to the Narcan, though, mm -hmm. uh, while it saves lives, which we know, but the availability of the Narcan. Like five, ten dollars cheap. Um, and the reason for that is so that loved right. ones can arm themselves and, and, and save their loved one. Um, the problem with it is it's creating this false safety net. And the same people are being Narcan three and four times in the same weekend. Um, kids are going to parties now, and instead of having a designated driver, they have a designated Narcan. They have one person who doesn't get high while everyone else does so that they can reverse the Narcan. Now, what you have to realize about Narcan when it's used on a pure opiate, like a pure heroin or on a pill, you need to spray maybe one or two doses up the nose for it to be effective. And it will buy you anywhere from 30 to 90 minutes to get that person to a hospital and get them medical intervention before the opiates fall back into those receptors that we have in the brain. If they're using heroin that's laced with fentanyl, you might have to use four, five, six doses of Narcan. That Narcan may still not reverse the overdose. And it usually will only give you 10 to 20 minutes to get that person medical intervention because the fentanyl is so, so potent and powerful. So all these people who are falling back on this false safety net of Narcan aren't realizing that that Narcan may not reverse a fentanyl overdose. Um, so Narcan is not a be-all, end-all. It's just keeping a lot of people alive longer is really what it's doing. Um, so this substance right here is why so many people in Western New York are dying. It's not so much about the heroin as it is about what's being added to the heroin. Now, people ask me every time I give this presentation, why is this fentanyl still legal? Um, and, and it's a little complicated to explain, but I'll do my best. So when the DEA does a drug raid, they confiscate what they find, and they send it off to a lab, and they have it tested the same way they're testing the marijuana. 
and they find out about all these different compounds of this fentanyl. And when they find out about them, they do what they have to do to get those substances put on their emergency schedule list of drugs. That takes time, but they do it every time they find a new analog. Well, every time they find a new analog and they make that analog illegal, over in China where they make the drug, guess what? They change the analog. They change the chemicals that are being combined together, they ship it all back over here to the US, and the new chemicals are not illegal. When this happens, every new version of fentanyl that we seem to be getting is 10 or 20 times stronger than the last version that we had. So I mentioned to you that there were an insane number of overdoses in the last quarter of 2016 and the beginning of 2017. It's a new analog of fentanyl that we didn't have in the first half of 2016. So as tirelessly as the DEA works to get these substances illegal, every time they do, their fear is that the next one that comes out is going to be 10 times more deadly than the one before it. So, you know, it's, you know, it's a six half dozen the other, you know, it's pretty dangerous. Okay, we're going to switch gears for a minute. Any questions on any of the things I've already presented on? Okay. So, dabbing is the process of extracting THC oil from marijuana and smoking that oil in its purest form. All you need to do this is a heat source. Okay, that heat source can be, it used to be complicated. You used to have to use butane gas to do this, which was highly flammable, very dangerous. Now kids have figured out that they can use a hair straightener, a blow dryer, any type of heat source like that to extract this oil from the marijuana. Now, depending on how much oxygen gets to that THC oil will determine which type of substance is created. So this one over here is known as wax. You can see why. It looks just like your wax. It's very thick. It's very sticky. It's disgusting looking. This is known as shatter. It's an amber colored sheet of glass that you break into teeny tiny little pieces. This is known as butter. And commonly how you'll find that is kids will take like a Carmax tube of lip balm. They'll scrape the lip balm out of the tube, out of the tub. They'll put this stuff in there. It looks just like lip balm. This is, this doesn't have a particular name. It's just up here to show you it can be very dry and crumbly looking almost like um, like a foundation powder or something like that, very, very fine. And girls will take old makeup containers and dump the makeup out and put this, this stuff in there. So all of this kind of is determined based on how much oxygen gets to the THC. And the more oxygen that gets to the THC, the less concentrated the product is. But all of these, in their least potent form, are 10 times more potent than regular marijuana. So you put a tiny little dab of that wax, which is why it's known as dabbing, or the tiniest little piece of that shatter, you put it into an e-cigarette or a vaporizer. And when you put it into one of those devices, it will heat that substance back up into a vapable form, and you vape it. Now, parents every day tell me, if my kid was smoking marijuana, I would know it because I would smell it. Well, if they're dabbing, you aren't going to smell it. There's no marijuana odor whatsoever. It also doesn't leave a marijuana residue the way typical marijuana would. So you can't unscrew that device that they just smoked out of and say, oh yeah, they were smoking pot out of this. It doesn't leave a residue. Um, the problem with the dabs and the wax is that you develop such a tolerance to THC that kids are reporting that they're dabbing every hour of the day, they're still not maintaining a high. And so what do they do then? They progress into substances that provide them a longer window of being under the influence, and those substances tend to be the very physically addictive ones. Um, dabbing is by far and large the most common thing we're seeing teenagers do in the experimental phase of drug use. More so than they're drinking, more so than they're smoking regular marijuana, because they know the chances of getting caught with this stuff are slim to none. Um, it's also highly referenced in the music that kids listen to. Pay attention to the lyrics in some of the songs that your kids listen to. You will hear drug references if, if you pay attention. Um, another substance that is very, very popular with teenagers is a drug known as Molly. And several of you raised your hands when I asked if you knew what Molly was. And you may have heard of Molly referenced as a pure form of MDMA or a pure form of ecstasy. And when it first became popular in Western New York, that's exactly what it was. It was one of those substances that when a teenager took it, they knew what they were getting. There was no chance of it being cut or laced, and they were drawn to it. Um, what we know about Molly now is that 85% of it is made synthetically. So that process I explained to you with the fentanyl over in China, same thing is applied here. It's this combination of several different chemicals that mimic the effects of the pure ecstasy or the pure MDMA. 
<clears throat> um, Molly's popular with teenagers because it affects their senses. So if a kid goes to a concert and they're high on Molly, the lights are going to look ten times cooler. The music is going to sound ten times better. Somebody simply bumping up against their arm is going to cause a very euphoric feeling throughout their entire body. And so they're well-intentioned when they use it, and they only intend to use it at a concert or a dance club or a music festival. Um, the problem is when they wake up the next day, they have a hangover times a million. Plus, your emotions are severely impacted. One of our alumni girls describes it as being so depressed that she could be laying in her bed and her house could be burning down around her and she cannot get out of bed. That's how depressed and debilitated you are. So what do they do? They take more Molly so that they can level off and feel normal and feel better. And before they know it, they become addicted to it. Um, Molly causes the body to overheat very rapidly. As a result of that, people tend to dehydrate and they tend to pass out. Um, several of the music festivals that were scheduled this past summer in warmer climates of the country were canceled because so many people showed up at these venues high on this drug. They overheated. They passed out. The people around them were also high on the drug. And guess what they did? They trampled the people laying on the ground to death because they were so unaware of what was going on around them. Um, the other very unfortunate circumstance of Molly use is sexual assault and rape. Um, almost all of our girls that we've treated who have used this drug and a handful of our boys have been taken advantage of sexually under the influence of this drug because you have such a heightened state of arousal, but you're so unaware of what's going on around you that unfortunately it happens. Um, in the pure form, Molly comes in those fun colored tablets that you see there. They look just like ecstasy pills. In the synthetic form, it comes in that capsule. You break that capsule open. You can add that powder to somebody's food you can, or somebody's drink. You can bake it into food. Um, you can go to Topps or Wegmans and buy a bottle of vegetable glycerin and liquefy that powder into a vapable form. You can then put the liquid into an e-cigarette or a vaporizer and you can vape this drug. No aroma, no field test, won't show up on a drug test. Um, all of the synthetic drugs that are popular with teenagers right now, all of them are water soluble. And if they're water soluble, they can be liquefied into a form that you can put into an e-cigarette or a vaporizer. Now if we stop and think about how many kids we see walking around our communities with e-cigarettes and vaporizers, we should be concerned. Because first of all, most of them are not smoking nicotine out of those devices. Because guess what? They weren't smoking cigarettes before they had any cig. They're also not smoking that flavored vape juice that they'll tell you that they're smoking. Because that stuff is expensive and it has no effect on their body. They're not spending their money on that. They are buying synthetic drugs, they are getting high off their rockers, and the adults in their life are clueless as to all of this. Um, we have K2 Spice, Mr. Happy. Those are synthetic forms of marijuana. You may have heard of pump it powder or bath salts. Those are synthetic amphetamine. We have another one that's rearing its ugly head called Cloud9, which is also a synthetic amphetamine. That one you don't even have to do anything with. You drop it right into the e-cigarette or the vaporizer and you vape it. They are changing constantly. And all of them are legal because that same game the DEA is playing with the fentanyl, they're also having to deal with with all these synthetic drugs. Um, so if your child has an e-cigarette or a vaporizer, you should be concerned. Um, the last substance I want to talk about is lean, purple drink, scissor. They're all slang terms for the same stuff. And what it is is a combination of cough syrup, preferably that cough syrup is going to have some codeine in it, alcohol, soda pop, usually um, grape crush, and usually there's like a Jolly Rancher or some type of hard candy tossed into the cup. And that combination will cause a brief euphoria followed by a sedative state. And the reason why it's called lean is because when people drink it, they literally have to like lean against the wall to keep themselves upright. That's how sedated you become. Um, I don't know if you can see in this picture here, it looks just like grape soda. A lot of times they'll mix it, if the cough syrup is purple, they'll mix it with, with Sprite. Um, so this stuff has been around in the South, like the Texas area, since like the 1990s. Um, we didn't hear about it here in Western New York until about like 2009, 2010. And we heard about it for a short time, we heard about kids drinking it, and then all of a sudden it went away. We didn't hear about it at all. Well, in the last two or three months, I've heard of four different school districts having to deal with kids who brought this combination of stuff into school in a regular soda pop bottle and were drinking it. Um, it is highly referenced in the rap music that your children will listen to. Um, so again, we're not seeing a huge problem with it, but we're, we're beginning to hear about it again, so it's definitely something to be aware of. 
And that's what I mean when I say these drug trends change. Like, this stuff went away for a long time, now it's coming back. One of the positive things about working with kids in rehab is we get them into rehab right off the street. So we get the opportunity to talk to them about what their experiences were, and we can get this information out to parents long before the research is, is catching up. That's why most of you haven't heard of this stuff, because it's not being, you're not hearing news stories about it, you're not reading articles about it, because the research hasn't caught up yet with what, what's actually happening on the street. So what can you do if you have concerns for a child who you believe is using substance? Um, these are some of the most common recommendations that I give to families um, who are worried about their kid. And the first has to do with accountability and consequences. And if your child um, lives in a home where drugs are not accepted, that's it. Drugs are not accepted in your home. They should be well aware of that expectation. They should also be well aware of what the consequences are going to be if they don't honor and respect that expectation. Which leads to the second part of the bullet point. Um, we deal with families every day who are at their wit's end with their kids. You know, they're threatening to change the locks the next time their child comes home after curfew. They're threatening to call the police the next time they find drugs in their child's bedroom. And what we find with those very severe consequences is that very oftentimes they are threatened, but then when it comes down to it, they're not followed through on. Calling the police on your children is not an easy thing to do. And so the first time the kid comes home after curfew and the locks aren't changed or First time drugs are found in the bedroom and the police aren't called, the kid knows, oh, I can do this again. Mom and dad are full of baloney. They're not going to follow through. So we work a lot with families around coming up with consequences that they are comfortable enforcing. And there's two in particular that we see the greatest success with. And one has to do with removing access to social media. And everybody thinks about their cell phones and everybody thinks about their tablets. But sometimes we forget about the computer that sits in the living room attached to the wall with an Ethernet cable. Or sometimes we forget that their iPod can connect them to the Internet. You have to take away all of those devices. Um, the second consequence we recommend is removing access to transportation. Now, everybody thinks of the car that their high school senior got as a graduation gift, or they think of, you know, they, maybe they use the family car. But a lot of times we forget that a kid can also buy a bus pass. And we forget that a kid can pull their bicycle out of the garage and ride it to wherever they want to go. So again, if you remove access to all modes of transportation, um, when you do these two things, you completely cut them off from the people that they're using with and the people that they're buying from. And you are going to make it 100 times <clears throat> more difficult for them to keep doing what they're doing. Not impossible, but more difficult. And they're going to hate you for taking those things away because their social media is their whole life. So is their car. Um, but you... Most parents are comfortable enforcing that level of consequence. And we see greater success with that than we do with those more severe consequences that are only threatened. Um, I encourage all of you to get on the internet and use it as a resource. I can't tell you how much I've learned about drugs and alcohol from the websites that the kids are using. Um, you can go on Google and you will find hundreds of ways how to fake a drug test. You can go on YouTube and you will find within seconds dozens and dozens of videos that will teach you how to cook whatever drug it is you want to use into a liquid form so that you can put it into an e-cigarette or a vaporizer. You can have drugs and drug paraphernalia delivered to your front door. Um, no questions asked. Very, very easy to do all of this. There's a website. On that website, there's a calculator on there. You type in your age, your weight, your height, your gender. You type in the type of drug you want to get high on. And that calculator will spit back to you how much of that drug to take and how long it's going to be in your system for. This information is literally at their fingertips. Um, home drug testing has gotten a really crummy reputation over the years. A lot of parents think that home drug tests are not worth the money that they cost, whether they cost 20 bucks or whether they cost 60 bucks, because people think they're not accurate. Um, home drug tests are very accurate if you follow two guidelines when you give up a tox at home. The first guideline, it needs to be done randomly. So that means you can't test your child on the third Monday evening of every month when you come home from work so that you remember to give the drug test because after one or two months of doing that, they've got that figured out and they've got a whole month in between to figure out how to fake it. So it's awesome for the purposes of remembering to give the test. It's terrible for accuracy. Um, the second guideline, the drug test needs to be observed. And we encourage parents to follow their children right into the bathroom and watch them give the sample. If you are not comfortable doing that, if your child downright refuses to give you a sample because of that, 
You can stand outside the door, but you need to make them leave the door open partway because it will prevent them from adding water to their sample to dilute it. It will prevent them from going to a place like um, GNC or Vitamin World and buying a drink that they can drink that will dilute their urine. It will prevent them from standing outside the bathroom at the Galleria Mall, paying a stranger to pee in a cup, and then bringing that stranger's urine into the bathroom and, and using it for their cup. These are all things kids that we've treated have done. We've had kids on our campus go so far as to drink a capful of Clorox bleach to dilute their urine. Now let me tell you, that destroys the lining of their esophagus and their stomach and their intestines. But guess what? They went on Google and they read some forum that it worked for somebody else and they don't think twice about trying it. Now, these are kids who are a little more desperate and who are likely going to go to jail if they come up dirty on a drug test. But still, this information is on the internet and they're using it. Um, if you have prescription drugs in your home that you no longer need, especially controlled substances, you need to get rid of them. Um, and there's only a couple safe ways to do that. A lot of people flush them down the toilet. Don't do that. They are destroying the water. Um, a lot of people will throw them out in their trash mixed in with coffee grounds. If people know you have prescriptions in your home, they will dig through your trash. Um, we have two safe ways to dispose of prescription drugs. The first thing that you can do every year in either April or October, um, the DEA will host a pill take back event. I know they typically do them here on the island. Um, and you can drive up to these events, you drop your drugs off, you drive away, nobody asks you any questions. Law enforcement gets rid of the pills. Now we have, yes? I was going to say, we have it at Town Hall. Good. You have a permanent drop box? Yeah. That's what I'm going to mention. So you have one at Town Hall. It's a permanent drop box. It's, they sh is it green colored? I think most of them are green. Okay. They look like mailboxes. They're metal boxes. Most of them are like a hunter green color. Um, they're located at police stations, town halls. A lot of pharmacies will have them. You can walk up to those boxes. You put your drugs in them, just like you would drop mail into a mailbox. Um, they cannot be penetrated from the outside the same way someone can't reach in a mailbox and take your mail out. Um, when they fill up, they're emptied by law enforcement. Law enforcement takes them to Cavanta in Niagara Falls, and they incinerate the drugs. So there's no chance of your identity being stolen off the bottles. You can throw the bottles and everything right in the box. Um, that is the only safe way to dispose of prescription drugs. If you have prescription drugs in your home that you need, that's okay. Um, but what we encourage you to do is go to Rite Aid or Walgreens and buy a lockbox. Put your drugs in that lockbox and keep that lockbox in an area of your home that is not frequented by visitors. Do not store your controlled substances in your kitchen cabinets or your bathroom medicine cabinet. And I'm going to tell you why. Um, we had a boy in treatment years ago who supported his drug habit for a minimum of six months without spending a dime because his parents were looking to buy a new home and he went to all of these open houses pretending to have an interest in where he might live someday. And he raided the kitchen cabinet and the medicine cabinet of every single house they went to. Now think about it. If your drugs are in your bathroom or your kitchen and your kids have friends over, they use your bathroom, they raid your fridge. Even if you noticed that those pills were missing, you would have no clue who took them. Um, so again, if you need them, that's okay. Just keep them locked up and keep an eye on them and make sure that they don't go missing. Um, the other thing that I will warn you, if you... This is, this is a tough one. Um, if you lose a loved one, you cannot keep their prescriptions in their home or in your home while you attend their wake and their funeral services. Because people are reading the obituaries and they are breaking into the houses of loved ones and stealing these medications. So it's the last thing you want to have to think about when you're having to go through the process of saying goodbye to somebody that you love, but you need to, you need to remove those from the home before you attend those services if you can because people's houses are being broken into. And that's the last thing you want to have to deal with when you're having to deal with everything else that comes with um, the passing of a loved one. Um, so this concludes my portion of the presentation. Um, I'm going to leave my contact information up there for you guys. I encourage you to take out your phones and take a picture. Jot it down if you have to. Contact me if you work somewhere that will let us come in and give a presentation. We're happy to do that. Um, at this point in time, I want to introduce you all to Ginny. Um,